Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. Bertha Sewabunsi coming to you this morning with a word of inspiration on Hope of Glory Network. This morning, my message is entitled, What Are You Looking At? What are you looking at? This is part of a faith series I'm doing this week. Three days ago, I talked to you about what do you believe? Yesterday, I talked to you about what are you thinking about? And today, I'm sharing with you about what are you looking at? By the end of my message, you will have shifted your focus, your belief systems, and your thoughts from things that make you afraid to things that give you faith. Today, I will be reading with you from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. And in that passage of scripture, a certain ruler, a very great man at that time, came running to Jesus and needed help for his daughter. And I read Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship onto the other side, much people gathered around him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, come and lay hands on her, that she may be healed, and that she shall live. The Bible says, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him, and a certain woman, which had an issue of blood for twelve years, interrupted them. But let me get back to the main story. Today I want to focus on Jairus and not on the woman who by faith touched Jesus. For those of you who have children, when your daughter lies at the point of death, you get desperate. Your paternal and maternal instincts come to the forefront. This gentleman was faced with a situation like this. And I remember reading in one of Barack Obama's books how his last daughter was stricken with meningitis and they had to take her to the hospital and they stayed up all night. So I know most of you will identify with it in one way or the other. The Bible says, and Jesus went with him. And uh, on the way, a woman with an issue of blood stopped Jesus and touched his clothes. And I can imagine Jairus' anxiety. He's like, you'll be saying, Jesus, can you hurry up? My daughter is dying. You're touching all these people and engaging with them. Come, quick. As a physician, I can appreciate it when someone is at the point of death. They're probably unresponsive, their heart rate is increased, they have a fever, their breathing is shallow, and they, in clinical terms, they may be in septic shock. If they had intensive care units back then, they'll be on a mecha mechanical ventilator, they'll be intubated, they'll be on a dialysis machine, they'll be in multi-organ failure. Um, simply looking at this 12-year-old, even a layman, who was any, pers any person who is not a physician would be able to tell that she is at the point of death. That is how desperate this man's situation was. And um, this morning, are there some things in your life that you keep looking at and it appears it's at the point of death? Maybe you, you can look at it one more time and the more you look at it, the more you get convinced by virtue of your five senses that this is dead? Is it your marriage? Does it feel dead? Are your lines of communication gone? Is it your career? Do you feel like it's dead? Do you feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again? You don't seem to be making any ascension? Is it a medical diagnosis? Like Jairus' daughter's situation. This morning, God wants you to look at something different and choose to believe. The Bible says that in verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking to that woman, there came certain people from the ruler's house and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? Now I want you to watch closely what was happening here. This man had a daughter who was at the point of death, but at the time he left home, she wasn't dead. So 
he had an, a little bit of faith. You know what? If I can just get this man Jesus, if I can just bring Jesus, he came and said to Jesus, please, please, Jesus, come quick. The Bible says he besought him greatly, come and lay hands on him. And then finally he gets news that, you know what? Stop troubling the master because your daughter is dead. Can you imagine what happened to his faith? The little faith that he had just went out. He probably just left. You know what? Okay, master, it's fine. You don't need to come anymore. The situation is over. It's dead. But the Bible says in verse 36 that as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. Based on what I've been sharing with you this past week, you know that Jesus knew that if the man believed all things were possible to him, and if he was not afraid, his daughter will be healed. Whatever you allow your belief system to hold on to, you will realize it. If you allow fear to get hold of you, it will work. For example, Job was a very rich man, but apparently all the time he was greatly afraid that he would lose his wealth. So the devil was able to ride on that fear and go to God and say, you know what, I can have access to Job through his own fear. I can make him sick and broke. He already believes it. So when calamity came on Job, he confessed that the thing in Job chapter 3 verse 25, he said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. So going back to Jairus, he had an image of his daughter at the point of death, and he had enough faith. He was showing his faith by coming out. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. His faith was being manifested by coming out and getting Jesus. Then suddenly he hears the news that, you know what? Your daughter is dead. Jesus knew immediately, immediately, that his faith would be replaced by fear. The Bible says as soon as Jesus heard the word, he says, be not afraid, only believe. This morning, be not afraid, only believe. In your room, say it with me. Be not afraid, only believe. 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 This morning, America, do not be afraid, only believe. Ghana, Nigeria, United Kingdom, Russia, wherever you hear my voice, do not be afraid, only believe. In the United States, we hear of ISIS, shootings, threats, terrorism, people and situations who have determined to put the nations of the earth in fear. Oh, but this morning, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God will watch over his people. I speak to the nations this morning. Do not be afraid, only believe. The Bible says in verse 37 that after Jesus had told him, do not be afraid, and he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the, bro the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeing the tumult that was going on and those who wept and were wailing gravely, verse 39, and when he was come in, he said unto them, why make you this ado and weep? The dumb soul is not dead, but sleepeth. Verse 40, and they loved him to scorn and when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entered in where the damsel was lying. He took people of faith, because he knew the parents knew their daughter's life was at stake. Verse 41, and he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto you, arise. And straight away the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. Verse 43, and he charged them straight that no man should know it and commanded that something be given to her to eat. I take it that Jairus chose to believe when Jesus 
told him to fear not but only believe. And so his faith was able to get his daughter well. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 23, we read about another similar situation. Jesus had gone to pray in a place by himself and had been away from his disciples. But the disciples were at sea. The ship was being tossed. And the Bible says that the wind was contrary. And Jesus walked to them on water. And I read. And straight away Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, the Bible says that Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out with fear. But straight away, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee. And he said, Come. And based on those words, Come, Peter walked on the water. The Bible says in verse 29, And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when, mm, but, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt? But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. I learned a lot from this lesson. Faith will let you walk on water, but fear will make you sink. And you can lose your faith depending on what you're looking at. This morning, what are you looking at? As long as Peter kept on looking at Jesus, he walked on water. But when he shifted his focus to the wind, he began to sink. The wind was already boisterous. Verse 24 says that the, sea was all, the ship was already being tossed. It had already been boisterous. But when he saw Jesus, his focus, his mind, and his belief was, if Jesus said, I should come, he didn't just step on the water. He was waiting for a word. He says, bid me come. And Jesus said, come. However, he shifted his focus. This morning, what are you looking at? This morning, is your focus constantly on the things that are eating you up? Or are you looking at Jesus? It's a mental exercise, but I want you to do it. Shift your focus from the things that are bothering you. That look to be at the point of death. And run to Jesus and besought Jesus and say, Jesus, I can look at you. So long as I'm looking at you, there is a solution. This morning, if you have contrary evidence that keeps looking at you, I want you to challenge you to focus your attention or your mind on Jesus. If you read the rest of the story, after Paul, he caught Peter. The Bible says, and they were coming unto him, the ship, the wind ceased. Then they went, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, you are the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came unto the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought him all that were deceased and besought him that he, if only they might touch the hem of his garment. And the Bible says, as many as touched him, they were made perfectly whole. Praise Jesus. They were made perfectly whole. This morning, if you can mentally touch Jesus, Jesus is not physically there in your room or in your car or wherever you may be hearing the sound of my voice. But by faith, if you can submit your thoughts, your beliefs, and your heart to him and say, Lord, I choose not to be afraid. I believe you can take care of this. Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us to keep looking unto Jesus, looking at his power and his ability to work miracles and intervene for us. He is described as the good shepherd of the sheep, our intercessor and our high priest. Just as Jairus ran unto him when his daughter was at the point of death. This morning I want you to run to God in prayer. The Bible says that Jairus, he pleaded with Jesus greatly. 
this morning, are you calm in your prayers or are you learning to plead and say, Lord, come through for me. You've got to come through for me. A situation in my life is at the point of death. Talk to him. And as I said yesterday, focus on him. Think faith. Hebrews 11 talks about the great men of faith who achieved great things. Turn to Hebrews 11 and read it in your leisure time. But it gets on to Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. It says that, Wherefore, seeing that we also are compassed by so great a cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What are you looking at this morning? Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Shift your attention to Jesus. Verse 3 goes on to say, For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your minds. Look at Jesus and consider him. Finally, I share with you from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 to 23, still talking about what are you looking at this morning? The Bible says that there was a time in Israel when the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Hmm. Syria was taking military strategy. And whenever they took their military strategy, somehow Elisha would get wind of it and tell the king of Israel, Beware, don't pass here, don't pass there. This is what is being plotted against you. This was high-level military intelligence. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants. In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him up. And he saved him there, not once, nor twice. It means many, many times. <laughs> the military strategy of Syria was not working because there was a man of God in the, in the, in the land of Israel. Therefore, the heart of the king of, Is of Syria was so troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He thought somebody within his cabinet was releasing information to the Israelites. He thought there was an inside traitor. Verse 12, and one of his servants said to him, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is that I may send forth and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. What it means is that Syria had sent chariots, horses, and a great army to come and capture Elisha. Verse 15, and the Bible says that and when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, Behold, an host compassed the city with horses and chariots. And his servants said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Elisha's servant was crying out, What are we going to do? Look at this army and these chariots. We don't even have a gun. Look at them. Verse 16, And Elisha answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Verse 17, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. Oh, hallelujah. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Oh, this morning I'm reminded of the verse that says that the Lord encompassed around his people. The Bible says that the angels of the Lord encompassed around his, them that fear him. You may not see angels around you, but every morning that you wake up, there are angels watching over you. The physical things that you see that look threatening, don't let them make you afraid because there are more for you than them that are against you. 
God opened the eyes of the young man and he saw that all oh, those chariots and armies that the king of Israel had sent was nothing because in the realm of the spirit there were chariots there were horses chariots of fire they just came with chariots but God had chariots of fire and the Bible says that I will talk about what how the story ends it's really funny but this morning I came to tell you that fear not for in the realm of the spirit there are more with you than against you just like Elisha prayed for his servants to open his eyes to see who was on their side in the realm of the spirit I pray that your eyes will be opened this morning that you will see that Jesus in your, is on your side and as Hebrews 12 says that we, there are an innumerable company of angels you know they saw a host horses and chariots of there are an innumerable company of angels surrounding you what are you looking at are you looking at the innumerable company of angels or are you focusing on what's going on around you what are you looking at mentally and spiritually look at Jesus take your attention off of the things that are causing you anxiety that's the, the things that make you ask like Elisha's servant what shall we do he says how shall we do this morning God loves you and he's working for you he is working for you if you do not know Jesus meet him you can find him in the books of Matthew Mark Luke and John he was spoken of in Isaiah and Revelations buy a Bible go to your local bookstore and buy a Bible for yourself and begin to learn about this man Jesus begin to learn about this man Jesus accept a relationship with him talk to him think about him and walk with him your life will never be the same this morning the Lord bless you and keep you may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace this has been Dr. Bertha Ayi coming to you with a word of inspiration on Hope of Glory Network I would like to hear from you you can send me mail at sewabibi at have a wonderful day and God